breaking convention earlier this year. So without more, Baba Kalindi, welcome to the Anu Asafo Show. Well, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate the uh, honor of being on your show. Well, it's a great pleasure for us to have you. Um, um, Baba, my introduction of you was somewhat sparse, and um, as usual, to just get you warmed up, too, because we can't wait to hear about the magic mushrooms. But um, please tell us a little bit more about how you, how you evolved from, from your earliest time to your present spiritual journey. Um, well, uh, my basic uh, vocation as far as uh, what I do to make a living, I teach ancient and contemporary African fighting sciences in the last part of the 1960s when uh, black was beautiful and you had the uh, organizations uh, in prominence, you know, the Black Panther Party, the Republic of New Africa, uh, so on and so forth, the Shrines of the Black Madonna, Go, all of the different organizations on the, the move to deal with the liberation of our people and the uh, atrocious conditions that we were living on in, in the uh, United States and the rest of the world, uh, addressing those things, I said that, well, uh, if everywhere else around the world had martial arts, Africa must have martial arts also. So I uh, went on an intense uh, journey to find these African martial arts and been able to talk with and learn from and get a chance to work out with uh, many different brothers from the continent um, I made that relationship and found the martial arts that I was looking for, uh, eventually traveling to Africa uh, many, many times to study and uh, get a chance to uh, fulfill my destiny as a, a, warrior, a warrior scientist. So uh, martial arts is my vocation. Uh, the other half of my vocation is that I... Uh, grow gourmet and medicinal mushrooms and have an understanding of the uh, traditional uses of the what they call or have deemed to call today the magic mushroom or the mushrooms that provide a spiritual uh, basis behind much of the things that we uh, look at and deal with today as theory who actually uh, does that um, splendidly if I may humbly say to myself um, as you said, you have the background in reading uh, Dr. Ben and in, in some of the uh, classic Pan-African uh, titles, but you also, with, with your research into the mushrooms, you also um, you bring a practical side um, to African traditional spirituality that a lot of people are just talking theoretically about the Orisha and things of that, but you actually bring forth and talk about spiritual travels. So um, we, we are very, we're very happy to have somebody here who's bringing, bringing the two uh, systems together. And um, I'm just going to be quiet and let you talk because uh, I've heard your, your videos on, online and uh, you're quite a dynamic speaker and you know what you're talking about so I don't need to ask you too many questions. But um, uh, please, first, um, we usually have more listeners than we have time to address their questions. So would you uh, stop right now and give our listeners some contact information on you where they can get in, um, in contact with you during and after the show, um, please. Well, um, you can go to my website where you'll find my uh, email address and my uh, and my contact number. The uh, email address is uh, www.tamarian. That's t a m e r r i a n. dot com, and that's www. Tamarian.com, and there you can get all of my contact information and things like that. And, you know, I'm generally, if you Google my name, Kalindi Iyi, or Ahati Kalindi Iyi, or the Tamarian Institute, you'll uh, run into a lot of uh, uh, a lot of the positive sites. <laughs> you'll, you'll run into a few probably of the negative sites also, um, because uh, uh, many people have things to protect as far as their 
um, uh, what they deem as their spiritual systems or uh, religious systems and things like that. They have things to protect. I have nothing selling anything to anybody. I don't uh, have anything I'm going to uh, give you. I can't really teach you anything. You know, uh, I said that for one man to teach another man is like one grain of sand trying to teach another grain of sand what the desert's about. Um, we have to understand that, you know, um, it is the uh, uh, it is the universe, it is the multiverse, it is the uh, the nature of what we are embedded in that teaches us. So all I do is say, um, here are the realm, here is existence and power that we talk about in legend, that we talk about in the old days, and they're directly in contact with our genetic uh, our genetic system, our DNA. They're uh, accessing, uh, pulling out things that are dormant. They're activating certain things. But um, listen, we are in a uh, uh, a battle here, uh, and if we don't understand that we're in a battle, we t- we waste time, and we're wasting time by not adopting these things into our practice, into our you know our lifestyle because. It's not a free ride, you know. I get with some of the folks who are meditators or who, you know, say, well, you know, you should sit down and meditate for 16 hours a day and breathe and things like that. All that's well and good. It's good discipline. It could even be beneficial inside of the compendium of of uh, the hyperdimensional realms that you traverse when you take the actual mushroom. But I think it's solely insufficient. Um, some people say, "Well, I'm already there. I already, I'm already in those states of consciousness. I don't need any artificial things." But these things aren't artificial. These are organic technologies that were were given before this world was formed, before this sun was formed, and it has the galactic information inside of the akashic records or the akashic records. And when I say akashic records, I mean an actual library that is uh, in contact with the pineal body, the pineal gland inside of the body, which in the 47th day migrates from a cell in the roof of the mouth into the ventricle system. It's not part of the brain, but actually is the master control gland. And that master control gland through the serotonergic cascading system, in other words, from serotonin, from tryptophan, eating that, you make serotonin. Serotonin is what your brain uh, wor- uh, uh, runs on day to day. Regular consciousness is the, is the serotonin. It is converted into melatonin. There are sidebars and side, ch- side chains where your brain makes pinealine. It makes beta carbolines uh, uh, and all the different neurochemicals that are hallucinogenic inside of the brain, and then ultimately DMT, which is dimethyl uh, return with the ancestors, you know, from because and the ancestors are in the place inside of the carpet. That's the whole thing about the genie and the lamp. The lamp is a place that you go into or that the gene or the gen live in. It's a place of access, a point or portal, which you would call today a stargate or a black hole that holds a whole dimension of knowledge and symbolism is living. So these systems that we're talking about are actual places, and you can actually experience them in levels of reality that are just as real as what you're looking at now, but in reality much more real because there's no confines of the, the, the physical area. There's no confines on it. You know, physics doesn't apply. You can see anything that you can imagine and anything that you couldn't imagine, and that's really what the uh, power plants are for. We use it for um, understanding of the the martial sciences, how they came about and how they were uh, downloaded to the earth, just as societies were downloaded to the earth. Kemet didn't just come about because you had great African thinkers. Kemet was downloaded to the earth by pre-Kemetic priests, the pre-Kemetic priesthood that took these things, the same things that are available to do, that you can do now on a long Saturday night. When they went into these 
different realms of understanding and met and saw what they saw, they wanted to then, when they came back into the consciousness of the regular three-dimensional world, build what they saw in light in those hyperdimensional worlds, they wanted to build that on, on earth. And what they had was available to build with was stone, and that's what they did. That's where the pyramid come, came from. Nobody just walked past one day and said, let's make a big pyramid. There was no basis for it. There was nothing that was a pattern in nature for it other than mountains, but the actual sojourning in these hyperdimensional realms is where they went and saw Tekken and pyramids and uh, bird-headed men and all of these different types of things. They came back and they patterned the society after that. So it was downloaded to the pre-comedic so-called priesthood, and then they built what they saw in those hyperdimensional realms in stone upon the earth. And it was no different at Angkor Wat or with the um, uh, Mayan, uh, Aztec, Toltec, uh, but, um, whatever. How, how does it one... Um, it was the same in Thailand. You know, we went way through all the type of different mushrooms. And then I wanted to ask about questions of uh, legality, because I understand some mushrooms are legal, some are not. And, uh, and, and yes, and just please, go ahead. Well, well, first of all, we'll put the caveat out there that uh, the mushrooms I'm, I'm talking about are classified as a Schedule One drug with the United States and most of most places around. So when I just mind, of course, they're in a place that it's uh, it's uh, legal and lawful to do so. Uh, but it is a Schedule One drug. It's put in the same category as uh, heroin. Well, not really heroin because that has a <laughs> that has a usage. It's the top tier of the drug enforcement law. In other words, for having the compound, uh, you'll have uh, legal difficulty and ramifications inside of that. So uh, don't. this is for informational purposes only. Snicker, snicker. Um, the, there, as you said, there are several types of mushrooms, and uh, I suggest to everyone to do your research uh, I, I am a resource on these things, on, on this type of information, but do your research. It's a plethora of information on the uh, World Wide Web, Google, about magic mushrooms, that, that, which ones uh, to use. Uh, we recommend utilizing the psilocybin mushrooms, uh, psilocybin cubensis, because it's uh, fairly easy to grow. It's uh, it's physically safe. It has a high LD50. LD50 is lethal dose 50, and that is any compound that you can feed 100 rats before it kills 50 of them. So all compounds have an LD50. Water has an LD50. Salt has a LD50. Sugar has an LD50. Um, and psilocybin, which is the compound inside of the mushroom is it has a very high LD50. You would have to eat your body's weight of psilocybin mushrooms in one setting before you could physically kill yourself with it, meaning that it's virtually impossible to kill yourself. You cannot overdose. Your body recognizes it. In other words, if you ate uh, a whole bucket full, uh, an eight-gallon bucket full of psilocybin mushrooms, you wouldn't kill yourself with that. You could eat Ten buckets, you wouldn't kill yourself with it. So it's a very safe compound. Now, it can be psychologically demanding and challenging. Whatever you have that is embedded in your psyche that you are trying not to face on these compounds, at some point in time you well, will face yeah, that. Took, you know, back in that. the 70s or the 60s, I uh, took some acid and it freaked me out and I basically haven't been back and or people who have take, taken um, sub-threshold doses of mushrooms, because I'm talking about mushrooms in the higher grams, nine grams and above, and that's, uh, uh, to many people, an extreme dose. But if you want to do and understand what the ancestors did and understand what the ancestors understood, you must do what the ancestors did and to move on past what the ancestors did into the realm of the day, 
that we move past the knowledge of the ancestors and into the new realms of understanding, you have to do what the ancestors did not do, and that is move higher and deal with more of what uh, what this thing really is. So it's uh, uh, it's uh, uh, one of those things that you have to, uh, as life moves on, uh, get more and more of. I say, I say. Um, hearing you speak about these things, it brings back a memory. I'm, it's not from the 70s or the 80s, but um, I had the great privilege of going to school in the Midwest. And I uh, wish I understand you are from the great state of Michigan. Yes. But um, I had the experience of going to school in, um, in Iowa. And uh, mushrooms are pretty big out there. And I had mm-hmm. many of the apprehensions that you just talked about. But I, I try to be open-minded at times, and um, <clears throat> I've had an experience or so. Okay. And, and I've found exactly what you're talking about. You know, I've, uh, I've talked to a lot of people in African traditional spirituality uh, about tapping in and, um, and use some of the different techniques. But um, my most intense tapping in experience is by way of... Uh, Mushrooms. In fact, um, mm-hmm. I'm New Orleans. I'm not used to snow, and uh, I had the experience of hearing across. It must have been a half a block away, just somebody's footsteps in the snow, and it was so mm-hmm. clear, and it was so focused, and all these little noises were out. And um, so I, I feel you 100%, and I. I hope other people take the opportunity to try things out you're talking about. Um, in this regard, I saw a documentary recently. It was talking about Latin American shamans. Um, I think the guy was in the Amazon or something. And um, I saw your video, one of your videos, um, the other day, and you were talking about the substance the called, I think it's pronounced. Later domesticated and became part of society. Then it, you know, from there, once it, once the Sahara started drying up, that's where actually what created uh, Kemet. Because when uh, water wasn't available and desert was encroaching, it pushed people to the only available water source, which was uh, the Nile or what they call Hopi. And that happened all in, in many different places. It pushed people to the Tigris Euphrates. It pushed people to the Jordan. So um, these accumulations and uh, these co- and co- inclusiveness of these people um, coming together uh, brought about uh, domestication of different animals, city-states, uh, large priesthoods, uh, all because of uh, the desert encroaching in, uh, drying up the mushrooms in the water and pushing people into uh, accumulative states. So ayahuasca is that. Sometimes uh, the so-called shaman you know, they go through different rituals where they take it and the patient doesn't. Sometimes the patient takes it and the shaman takes it both at the same time. It's done for uh, spiritual work, the getting rid of demons, soul retrieval. Some people would uh, be in comas and things like that, and they're wandering in, you know, different states of consciousness out there, and the shaman would take the medicine and go into that state of consciousness and find a person's soul, bring them back uh, to their body, things like that are all part of the ritualistic uh, things that happen when uh, these compounds are taken for certain reasons. And that's no different than in South Africa, in North Africa, East and West Africa, no different than in Indonesia and other parts of the world. Uh, Everybody has their entheogen power plant and different things that are part of their culture that they utilize. Now, I I keep saying so-called shaman because, uh, you know, shaman is just the colloquial word that they use now. You know, they used to use witch doctor, medicine man, uh, witch, those type of things, but that became, you know, something that uh, was offensive to certain people. So they use shaman. The only people that are truly shaman are the spiritual people in Siberia. 
and they utilize the Amanita muscaria mushroom, which is the red and white mushroom, of where we get um, the colors of Santa Claus, because Santa Claus is a shaman. You know, he has reindeer. Reindeer are the most prolific eaters of the Amanita muscaria mushroom, which is the red mu mushroom. Um, <laughs> they eat the magic mushroom and the reindeer fly and so on and so forth. The shaman in Siberia, they have a red sack of which they gather the mushrooms. They dry them in front of the, the hearth in socks. When they go to do work, they come down the chimney. And the fruit when you learn of the pine tree of blacksmithing like that by actually doing. These people get initiated. They walk around in white, put some beads on, hold the onk, and then they feel that they're knowledgeable about something. Initiation means nothing unless you have training that goes behind the initiation. You know, singing two or three songs, don't get it. There's medicine that goes along with it that gives you access to the worlds where the deities themselves teach you. And many of these compounds have the mushrooms in it. Every priesthood that is legitimate has its medicine that will bring you into those states of consciousness, and the mushrooms are in there. They may put rhinoceros piss, old bark, dirt, cow dung, mix it all up in a hand blender, but the mushrooms are in there, and that's what sends you to the place that you go on. But they all have their formula, and they'll all give it to you. And you may have to ingest some horrible stuff to get the mushrooms in it, but what I have uh, gotten to a point to, to reveal is that we need these things. There's only a forward escape out of this. There's no going back in nostalgia to the good old days. The pyramids are built. They've been there for 10,000 years. We can't go back to that. There's no need to go back to that. There are only um, points of remembrance to show how we can move forward. So it's a forward escape. These things will give us the understanding, the power, true knowledge and experience to be able to move ourselves forward because the things that are coming from uh, the technological movement, the singularity movement, robotics, cyborgism, all of these things are at our doorstep. You know, I was talking yesterday uh, 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 coming out of town, and we were talking about, uh, she said, relationships and how uh, can we deal with relationships? I said in five years, 50% of the relationships are going to be between humans and robots. You're going to have surgically uh, created hermaphrodites, people that have a penis and a vagina. You're going to have people that have, augmentate, that have cyborg augmentation. Second life is a reality that is uh, being pressed into um, our regular everyday life. So these are the type of things that we have to deal with for our technology. Those forms are located at orishareligion.com. That is O-R-I-S-H-A-R-E-L-I-G-I-O-N.com. As well as our at sedulupouse.com. Also, sign up for the new newsletter for the latest happenings in the new community. The newsletter can be found by going to anewnation.org. That is A-N-U-N-A-T-I-O-N dot org. If you'd like to become an on-air guest or sponsor on a new ASAPO or any of our other broadcasts, please be sure to contact us at questions at anewnation.org. That is the word questions at anewnation.org. Thank you for your continued support, and be well.
Love to heal a nation is the greatest of man Now the time come to sit down and rediscover what life Show the world the true meaning of real love power Not try Dr. Maya Angelou speaks for all of us in this tribute to the great man. His day is done. It's done. The news came on the wings of a wind, reluctant to carry his burden. Nelson Mandela's day is done. The news expected and still unwelcome reached us in the United States, and suddenly our world became somber. Our skies were lit. His day is done. We see you, South African people, standing speechless at the slamming of that final door through which no traveler returns. Our spirits reach out to you, Bantu, Sulu, Rosa, Boa. We think of you and your son of Africa, your father, your one more wonder of the world. We send our souls to you as you reflect upon your David, armed with the mere stone, facing down the mighty Goliath, your man of strength, Gideon, emerging triumphant, although born into the brutal embrace of apartheid, scarred by the savage atmosphere of racism, unjustly imprisoned in the bloody malls of South African dungeons. Would the man survive? Could the man survive? His cancer strengthened men and women around the world in the Alamo in San Antonio, Texas. 